Hey, fantastic. Hey, it's really, uh, it's great to be here with this group and we really appreciate the invitation. And so uh, I'm here with uh, my collaborator, uh, Gus Satius here to, um, to my left. And uh, this is a project that we worked on uh, collaboratively. We um, both work for Skagit River System Co-op. Uh, Gus is a geomorphologist, I'm a hydrologist. Let's just take it from there. Our topic is uh, sediment and landslides as a component of the Skagit watershed recovery effort. The work that we do in the forest and fish program is, uh, is very much focused on upland areas and forestry in particular. Uh, this is an aerial um, satellite view of the watershed, as I'm sure you'll all um, understand. And um, we work in the dark green areas, which is the uh, forest land, especially the areas where there's ongoing uh, forestry activities. A lot of the work we do involves permit review, and this is a visual that shows where uh, uh, kind of a typical year of permits, we see about 200 come in the door, we review them all on paper, and we go out in the field and look at the proposals, and that's a big part of what we do. One thing you'll notice on the image there is that the uh, landscape that we work in has a lot, awful lot of trees, and it has a lot of uh, forest roads. Uh, we have some trout streams, and we have relatively few salmon streams, just because we're in the upland areas where the uh, access is a problem. But as you all probably appreciate, forest lands have a very strong influence on uh, water temperature and water quality and habitat processes, and so that's why the tribes have us doing this work. The main uh, uh, timber uh, managers in the basin are the state of Washington uh, through the Department of Natural Resources and Sierra Pacific Industries and a tree farm which was recently owned by Weyerhaeuser and is now owned by uh, by Hampton. So uh, and then of course we get a lot of applications from smaller uh, woodlot owners and kind of running the gamut there. So th as far as what we're going to talk about today, uh, I'll give you just a little bit of a outline moving forward. I'm going to kick things off with uh, some introductory um, slides and material, and we're going to talk about the basics of landslides, since our expectation is a lot of you don't deal with landslides on a day-to-day -day basis as we do. So I'm going to cover some of that, and then Gus is going to uh, tag in and um, talk about a landslide monitoring project that we have just recently been pulling together and uh, explain that and, and what we learned from that. And then uh, we're going to transition back to uh, to me, and I'm going to come in and uh, make some zoom out a little bit and talk about some broader implications and how some of this fits in with the overall uh, salmon recovery uh, effort in the Skagit. And then we're hoping that we'll have quite a bit of time left over for uh, questions and discussion. It's important to appreciate that the Skagit is, in its nature, a sediment-rich watershed. A big part of that is the recent glacial history. Uh, you know, the, the whole watershed was covered in ice as recently as 15,000 years ago. So the whole landscape uh, and the, um, both the geologic and, and vegetation communities are still uh, recovering from that. And as a result, we have a lot of steep slopes, as most of you know, who have been in the backcountry and in the mountainous areas. We also have two active volcanoes, uh, Mount Baker and Glacier Peak are both uh, major, major sources of, of sediment into the rivers and uh, habitats in the main stems. So uh, that's a big part of the overall story. And as we all know, we have a wet climate here with a lot of rainstorms and, and uh, hydrologic events that uh, tend to uh, make things happen on the hill slopes. Water and gravity always uh, wins. And as a result, a lot of the erosion that happens here comes in the form of landslides, uh, big, big uh, blocks of uh, soil and rocks and trees that can move down slopes quickly and um, sometimes impact uh, rivers and streams. And one thing that's important to realize is it's like a genie in a bottle is once those landslides happen, there's not a whole lot you can do to uh, fix it. You just have to watch things play out. Not every landslide hits a river or stream, but a lot of them do. When they do, Essentially, they're at the mercy of the of the waterway, which immediately uh, tends to move the material and sort it. Um, the finer uh, particles of soil and sand and and silt and that kind of stuff uh, moves through quickly, 
and it can have a high impact on the turbidity or the cloudiness in the water column. And also um, the sands and some of those uh, types of materials can contribute to gravel clogging, which uh, leads to problems for salmon with uh, spawning and incubation. So that's uh, an important um, factor. And obviously we could spend a whole day talking about aquatic impacts of landslides, and we're just gonna give a very quick flyover on some of the stuff. The coarser components, that would be your gravels and boulders and the big blocks of, of uh, rock. Uh, the main impacts from landslide material uh, of that character is um, burial of pools and, and a general uh, habitat simplification, which is, uh, is really more of an issue for rearing um, fish than spawning, but that's also a very important part of the impact of uh, landslides and also um, coarse sediment can take uh, years to decades, to even centuries to move through the uh, system because they're so large and they don't move as quickly. Uh, an important piece that's sometimes overlooked is the effect of landslides on riparian vegetation, both the um, slides themselves and then the, the accumulations of gravels and stuff can lead to uh, destruction and impacts to uh, trees and plants that are doing a lot of positive things for the watersheds. In some cases, landslides can deliver uh, functional woody debris, a little bit of a positive aspect to them, and um, we need to account for that as well. Not, not everything uh, revolves around fish. I, I hesitate to say it, but I do. Landslides obviously have imp uh, implications to uh, life and property and infrastructure such as bridges, and um, I just wanted to make mention of that because I'm not going to be talking about that much, but that is uh, part of why we care about landslides. Just to let you know what, what you're looking at here, this is a picture of Finney Creek and you can see the gray uh, turbid water coming out of this tributary and coloring uh, the green uh, water gray along that side of the channel. Okay, so if we wanna talk about landslides in the Skagit, we're gonna end up talking about logging and we certainly will today. This is a look backwards in time. This is an aerial photo taken sometime in the 1960s of a piece of forest land uh, south of the Skagit River, which you can see there in the upper left corner. Uh, Cumberland Creek is flowing through uh, the upper right just to get you located. What you're seeing here is uh, the lighter colored areas are areas that have been logged before the photo was taken. The, the bumpy stuff is the trees that remained. And you can see a bunch of streaks of white going uh, various directions. Some of those are forest roads and some of those are the tracks of uh, landslides. And if you're not seeing those, uh, this might help. This is only a fraction. This is quite a spectacular uh, photo showing kind of the worst case of what the outcome of some of the early logging uh, looked like. The good news is it doesn't look like that anymore. And we'll get to that. So how does forestry lead to landsliding? One of the main ways is through uh, clear cut logging. Uh, in which the trees are cut and, and the uh, root systems decay. And that leads to a uh, loss of the uh, root reinforcement that those live tree roots do to kind of hold the soil together and anchor it in some cases to the bedrock. And that's really an issue for the first uh, 10 to 15 years after logging because uh, the forests here regrow quickly and pretty soon you have new roots that come in and, and take the place of the old ones. Uh, one of the major issues with logging is also uh, canopy removal and effect it has on uh, water going into the soil. Uh, we, we have more water uh, due to that, as well as the trees not being there to suck the uh, water out as quickly. And this is a similar time scale to the, uh, to the root decay. There's a little bit of a, a silver lining here in that um, the locations on the landscape that are sensitive to harvest and becoming unstable is, is fairly predictable. We've gotten pretty good at recognizing the areas that are likely to uh, fail. And uh, a lot of the forest landscape, uh, you know, you could clear cut and you could slash burn and you could spray it till the cows come home and it wouldn't, and it wouldn't fail just because the slopes aren't conducive to that. So we're looking at seep slopes near streams in many cases and other places um, that uh, tend to be uh, proven areas of instability. So the other big trigger is uh, logging roads. Building a logging road has the same impacts to start out with as clear cutting in that you remove the trees uh, 
and the tree roots and the things we just talked about. And then there's some other things going on, uh, which is that once the road is in place, it tends to intercept some of the moisture coming down through the soil and then uh, run that, uh, concentrate that in certain places. If it's an unstable spot, you can contribute to uh, failure, as you can see in this picture with the culvert putting water on an area that was uh, became destabilized. And then building a road on a steep slope involves moving soil to build that nice platform for the road. And that if that's not on a stable uh, spot, that can lead to instability as well. Roads have the advantage that we can um, get to them and do repairs, or in some cases to even deconstruct roads. We'll be talking about that quite a bit. And the other thing I should point out is that the way that roads are built has changed a lot over time uh, because of awareness of instability. Forest landowners don't want their roads to fail because of the environmental impacts, as well as the fact that they want that road to be there uh, for future use. One thing we have going for us in the Skagit is, is the forest never sleeps. Uh, we have a forest uh, vegetation community that is extremely uh, effective at re, uh, reoccupying hill slopes and areas because of the mild climate here. You know, we've got uh, trees that grow really fast. Our conifer trees can live for 500 years or more. Um, we don't have a lot of forest fires here. So those roots come back pretty quickly. So the picture you're looking at here is uh, Upper Finney Creek on the Forest Service land, and a lot of those smooth green areas are areas that were clear cut in the 1950s through the 80s. And as you can see, uh, 30 to 50 years later, you have a dense uh, canopy of forests that are growing back. Some of those trees are 50 to 100 feet tall already. The forests are very good at growing back. So here's a little bit of a timeline. Uh, that sort of summarizes some of the key eras of forestry in the Skagit, and it's typical of Western Washington as well. Um, I, I'm going to spare you all of the details, but there's a couple highlights I want to point out because they'll help you understand um, where we're going from here. Obviously, the first logging and land clearing happened in the 1800s and really got into gear through the early part of the 1900s uh, as the uh, old growth timber was uh, being removed and either uh, used for building materials or farmland or, or various economic uh, interests. And then starting in the 1970s, we really had a kind of an explosion of uh, environmental initiatives that, that came forward that influenced how forestry was being done uh, here and elsewhere. A couple of things to point out is the first uh, Washington Forest Practices Regulations in the mid 1970s. The Timber Fish Wildlife Agreement um, in the 80s, which really got tribes and other agencies involved in, in reviewing forestry. Then the Forest and Fish Report, uh, the blue, uh, you see the little blue label there that came into place in the late 1990s was an agreement between the timber companies and agencies and tribes that essentially really upgraded uh, Washington's uh, protections on uh, industrial timberlands uh, to where they're, uh, you know, as, as strict as pretty much anywhere in the U.S., and in, in most cases, much more so. Um, the other thing I want to explain is this RMAP uh, acronym you see there from 2000 to 2020. That was the Road Maintenance and Abandonment Plan rules, which were part of the Forest and Fish Agreement, which essentially uh, required uh, industrial and state owners to uh, to basically review and repair all their old legacy roads and make sure that there weren't issues that needed to be corrected. So that was a major uh, initiative that is part of our story. And then on the bottom, we have a couple of the recovery steps that we'll talk about in the future as well. So despite these uh, all these uh, things that were happening in the 70s and 80s, the amount of land sites was, was going up dramatically. Um, this is a plot that shows the number of land sites per square mile. It's a compilation that I did before uh, that I did several years ago of different land site inventories in the Skagit, broken down into decade decadal bins. So, so folks that were paying attention to these things were seeing that they were probably hearing about all these things that were being done, but yet the rate of land siding was going up um, dramatically. So there's a lot of concern about that. And this is actually quite typical of what was going on in other parts of the, of the West Coast as well. So the next kind of big thing in the Skagit was the uh, watershed recovery strategy, which was developed by SSC and um, 
and other cooperators uh, in the Skagit. I don't. I wasn't here to be involved in that, but that was a, a, a important milestone that you all, I'm sure, have talked about quite a bit. Um, so I won't go into much detail. But I, I see the real visionary part of that was this uh, adoption of process-based restoration rather than going out and, and trying to fix the habitat with structures. It was really an emphasis on focusing on the root causes of the problems and trying to uh, stop the stop the bleeding before uh, you know we try to uh, uh, fix uh, things for the organisms at the bottom of the watershed. And so um, this is an important um, aspect that I, I think in, in this. And so I'm sure you've all probably seen this uh, map once or twice before. It's a map that came out of the watershed uh, recovery strategy uh, that shows ratings having to do with sediment um, sediment supply and it, it basically it was a GIS exercise that that uh, projected parts of the basin that had uh, amounts of sediment from landslides and roads that was was out of whack and impacting fisheries. So um, this was uh, basically when you look at this map, the pink areas are essentially the footprint of the major uh, logged areas of the Skagit. It was it's a pretty close overlap because of the legacy of impacts. It was uh, it was interpreted that all these areas had sediment problems to be addressed. And the main action that came from the um, watershed recovery strategy emphasized uh, repairing forest service roads, partly because that was a program that was happening at the time. And there were a bunch of uh, projects that came in the wake of this. This really set the stage for some of these projects that were being put forth by a number of different organizations, the forest service, had four major projects. Uh, the co-op did several and Skagit Conservation District in the county had a couple as well. And, and what you're looking at in the picture is a road that was uh, that was decommissioned. This is a forest road on the Forest Service land. And essentially what happened is uh, they went in there with a backhoe and a dump truck and pulled the, uh, the debris out of the stream bed here in a way so that there would be much less risk for that to fail as a landslide. And so that's what these projects tended to look like. It, you, you might look at that and say, that looks like a bunch of exposed raw soil, but I guarantee if we went out there 15 years later, you would have nothing but wall-to-wall -wall salmonberry and, and alder growing on that, holding it together quite effectively. So uh, that leads us to the Skagit Chinook Plan, which was released in 2005. It was another cooperative effort that really dealt with all of the the H's, uh, in addition to habitat, it also dealt with, with hydro and hatcheries and harvest as well. So that was a very broad based um, analysis. And again, I think there's many people in this room that know much more about this than I do, but I do wanna talk about the sediment um, parts of that. It really focused on implementation of the forest and fish regulations we talked about before on state and private land and really what those uh, comprised of were um, uh, unstable slope buffers and road um, work requirements. And so the Chinook plan essentially approached this at, with the idea that if these things were implemented properly, that they would expect that um, that the impacts from forestry on sediment would be uh, brought back into line and, and become much less of an impact. And as I mentioned before, this uh, a real key part of this is the road maintenance and abandonment plan program, which was required to be completed by 2021. This is kind of the follow-up to that sediment impairment map that we saw before. This is the this is one that came out of the Chinook plan. Essentially what they did is they said, once the RMAP work is completed, we expect this is where the impaired basins will be. And there you'll see there's a lot less of the pink than there was before, especially in that sort of that lower section of the um Skagit between Concrete and Mount Vernon, a lot of those watersheds were pink and now they're green because the expectation was there's a lot of roads, but they're going to be fixed through that RMAP program. And therefore, we expect the sediment coming off those to be much less. The areas that are pink in this map are Forest Service lands uh, that don't fall under the RMAP requirements. So I think there was a, a concern about whether the, the road networks in those areas would be treated um, adequately. And then the one on the um, I think it's Nooka Champs on the uh, western edge uh, has a lot of uh, non-industrial land that wouldn't be required to fix the roads. So this is a, a diagram that Eric Beamer um, supplied for us. 
that sort of puts this into context of the um, chapter nine, which is the chapter of the Chinook plan that deals with uh, with sediment from landslides, in particular because of the impacts on spawning habitat. The monitoring of uh, watersheds is not is not a simple uh, cause and effect kind of thing, and that you have your strategies that you have in the yellow box, which is your uh, the way you're going to go to address these issues. And then you're hoping that th th then you're planning for the actions to be conducted in the blue boxes in this case, which is to uh, fix roads and to implement um, buffers of trees. And then as a result of those, we expect to see the roads become more stable and landslide rates to go down. And then if that works, then we hope that the channel habitat will be improved. That's where things get messy because, of course, we have floods and other types of land use. We don't know what's going on there. So it's it just gets more and more complicated the farther down the watershed you go. And ultimately, you hope to get to the green circle there where we see the, the desired change in fish production, but yet we have to um, keep track of all these steps along the way. And I just want to point out that the work that we did with our monitoring, on-site monitoring, is really confined to this red box, which is uh, the, the things that are going on on the hill slopes, which is the road treatments, buffers, and the uh, and the landslide, um, change in landslide rates. So that's really what the next section of this talk is gonna focus on. So just to wrap up my little intro section here, it's 2023 and the question is, are we seeing any of those expected changes? SRSC has approached this by uh, getting funding for habitat status and trends monitoring. And one component of that is uh, landslide uh, rates as an indicator of freshwater habitat conditions. And in particular, uh, landslides are considered to be an index process for egg to uh, fry survival. And that leads us to the landslide inventory project. And I am gonna hand things off to Gus. Thanks, Kurt. So, uh, yeah, I'm Gus Satius. I'm the watershed scientist in the Forest and Fish Program. And as Kurt mentioned, I will be talking about our landslide inventory project. For this project, we address the following monitoring questions. They all re revolve around this first central question, which is, are there temporal patterns in landslide abundance? We also wanted to know what explains temporal patterns in landslide abundance? Are the patterns related to climate or storms? Are they related to, are patterns related to timber harvest rate? Or are temporal patterns in landsliding related to forestry practices? And by forestry practices, I mean some of the things that Kurt was mentioning earlier. So hazard avoidance, right? Avoidance of, of, of timber harvest on unstable slopes or road upgrades and decommissioning practices. So harvest rate is really the rate of harvest and forestry practices, I mean those, those kind of placement and upgrade type, type processes. So here is a map of the watershed that we all know and love. I'll point out that the blue lines are the salmon streams from the Swifty database and uh, the, the black hash, ha hatch pattern is uh, upstream of the major dams here. So there's no sediment transport out of these areas. We chose nine inventory basins to uh, use in our project. And those are shown in the darker black lines. All but two of these were part of watershed administrative units that were marked as impaired in the, um, in the, in the watershed recovery strategy. Uh, and those two that were not impaired were, were Lyme and Sloan here in the, in the upper part of the watershed. So we compiled in, in each of these, these inventory basins, we compiled, <laughs> we compiled pre-existing landslide inventories from the 1940s uh, that went up through the early 90s. And then we picked up the mapping on aerial photographs from the 90s up through 2019. And then really importantly, we were interested in how the different land management histories may result in uh, differences in landslide rates. And so we stratified the landscape into these management strata. Um, the first that I'll mention is ongoing management in the orange hatch marks. Um, 
ongoing management is state and private timberlands. These lands were essentially managed for commercial timber throughout the entire time series, uh, short rotation plantation forestry. They harvested the old growth forests, um, and now they're on to second growth, and in many places they're harvesting third growth forests as well. Legacy management is in blue, and uh, that also has a history of timber harvest. It's the it's the national it's the Forest Service, um, the Forest Service lands that were managed for commercial timber, but the management style there was much different. They they tended to do patch cutting. Um, they would leave sections of old growth in between these patches, and so it's a real mosaic of different stand ages, including some very old stands mixed in with the the more recent harvest units. And really importantly, they essentially stopped timber harvest, especially definitely clear cut timber harvest in the mid 1990s after the passage of the Northwest Forest Plan. And then no management is in that green color or that teal color, and that is portions of the landscape with no history of, for, of forestry. Into the heart of the, the landslide database, are there temporal uh, patterns in landslide abundance? <clears throat> so this is the time series of landsliding that we that we extracted from the compiled inventories and from our mapping, and it's broken into decade bins. And uh, the, I'll mention that the y-axis here is landslide volume divided by strata area so that we can compare against uh, the, the three strata against one another. And I wanted to point out that um, this blue, this tallest blue bar here in the 1980s in legacy management, that represents about 45,000 dump truck loads of sediment coming out of the, the seven of our inventory basins that had legacy management in, in, in them in that decade, just to give you a sense of scale. We, we can see that the, the, the overall pattern is this kind of bell-shaped uh, pattern with especially driven by the results in the managed forest landscape. In, in ma the managed forest landscape, landsliding peaked in the 70s and 80s, and then the 90s and 2000s and 2010s were were characterized by the, a much a greater or a reduced rate of landsliding. The opposite trend is apparent in the no management lands, which had a low point in the 70s and 80s, followed by an uptick in the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. And so we were really interested to try to figure out what could explain those, those different trends, starting with climate and storms. To get at the question of climate and storms, we did we took two approaches. One was kind of a regional qualitative approach that used um, some regional indices of climate, temperature, and precipitation. Um, and then we also did a more detailed statistical comparison between landslide rates and uh, storm uh, quantitative storm metrics that extracted from USGS flow gauges and precipitation data. Um, and so the, the flow gauge data is shown on the on the bottom chart here, uh, again, split into decade bins. And, and there are four bars here because that th those represent four USGS flow gauges uh, scattered throughout the, the watershed. And the main thing I want to point out here is that the 2000s experienced some of the largest storms on record at these gauges. And so it's unlikely that 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 storms can explain the signal coming out of man the landslide signal coming out of managed forests and that essentially was borne out with our statistical analyses where we found kind of a mixed but mostly unconvin unconvincing relationship between storm storm hydrology precipitation and landslide rates However, in the no management landscape, we did find some evidence for uh, a, a, a relationship between landsliding um, and climate in, in no management. We also wanted to know, do temporal patterns in landsliding correspond to timber harvest rate? To get at this question, we started from the assumption that tree age equals the time of harvest. And so if you can, um, come up with information across the landscape of tree age, you can come up with harvest rates over time. So we developed a stand age model that you that predicts age as a function of height and environmental covariates. And 
then we use lidar uh, data to which which gives us height to create maps of forest of predicted forest age. And so I'm showing that process in these in these maps here. The left map shows tree height that it's it's just the lidar data um, with the light lighter colors in it, uh, representing shorter vegetation and the darker greens rep representing taller vegetation. And so you can see that the the northern part of the watershed, there's a lot more clear cuts. There's a big uh, fish buffer down the main stream here. And then in the in the southern part of the water, this watershed that I'm showing, there's um this is actually forest service land where they, there's a lot more old growth and there's some patches of rocky, rocky areas and slides or um, avalanche scars and things like that. And then when when we uh, map our prediction of, of of stand age on onto that landscape, we can see that these darker browns, these are the clear cuts, and then the the the, the blue green color is is old forest um, and matches up pretty well with what we see in the height map. From that, we we can construct timelines of um, of timber harvest rate, and the metric of timber harvest rate is the percent of the strata area less than or equal to twelve years of age, which is what I'm showing here in this plot on the y-axis. Um, and 12 years is kind of the uh, approximate timeline where um, trees are regrowing trees in clear cuts are starting to, to really anchor the soil. And so this represents a metric of the percent of the area that is susceptible to post-logging landsliding. In, uh, and then these different lines in this plot represent the different inventory basins that, that have uh, legacy management lands in them. So what you can see in legacy management is that there was this drastic decline in harvest rate that occurred throughout the 90s after the, the inf implementation of the forest plan. Um, that pattern was not apparent in ongoing management where we saw a mixed uh, response um, of harvest rate throughout this throughout the time series, um, with some watersheds experiencing a large uptick toward the end with, uh, during the time where, where we saw reduced landsliding in, 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 in the managed forest landscape. And so when we did our statistical comparisons, we found a really compelling relationship between harvest rate, timber harvest rate, uh, and landsliding in legacy management, but no correlation between timber harvest rate and landsliding in ongoing management. So we wanted to know, do temporal patterns correspond to changes in forestry practices in ongoing management lands? I'm gonna stay really high level with this topic, uh, but I'm happy to engage with folks um, after this uh, if, if there's interest. So, um, Essentially, if you think about hazard avoidance, so placing buffers on unstable, unstable landscape elements, what the, the effect of that was to create a changing relationship of stand age and uh, topographic instability through time. Um, uh, and so we used our stand age maps and overlaid those with maps of unstable landforms to construct timelines of harvest rate on unstable landforms through time. Um, so this left map is a, is a map of a prediction of unstable landscape elements shown in red. Um, and then the right, the map on the right is the same location with uh, stand age, pred predicted stand age following the procedure I, I went through er earlier. And essentially we found uh, pretty compelling evidence that uh, there was uh, a decreasing amount of timber harvest on highly unstable land landforms over time um, th throughout the, the 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 time series in most of our basins that we looked at. This is what that looks like. Uh, the top figure shows mapping of high mo and moderate hazards uh, from a slope stability perspective, and then the bottom is an aerial photograph showing where the actual timber. Um, showing the timber harvest layout, and you can see they placed buffers on the on the high and moderate ha hazard areas, and so this imparts a signal of uh, showing the relationship between forest age and and um, hazard topographic hazard. If we look at the time series of forest road landsliding, it mimics the the time series of overall landsliding, 
Again, the orange color is ongoing management and the blue color is legacy management. And I just wanted to point out some of the details of the regulatory changes that occurred across um, starting in the 70s and throughout the rest of the timeline. In 76, there was the first forest practices rules passed for state and private timberlands in Washington. These first rules really emphasized road building techniques. They had hardly anything to do with, with timber harvest. It was all about roads. And in the next decade, in the 80s, there was a pretty drastic reduction in ongoing management road-related landsliding um, and really not much change in legacy management. In the 80s, there was the Timber, Fish, and Wildlife Agreement. And then the 90s is where a lot happened. Uh, there was watershed analysis, which, which um, impacted ongoing management. There was the Northwest Forest Plan, and there was the Mount Baker Snoqualmie plan, Forest Plan in or before the Northwest Forest Plan. Um, so there was a lot going on in both ongoing and legacy management lands to try to improve um, uh, uh, road building techniques, and also to, especially in legacy management, to jumpstart the decommissioning effort throughout the 90s. In 2000s, there was RMAP was kicking off, and the, the initial years of RMAP, the road maintenance and abandonment plan process, were really emphasized inventory work, and some of the some of the work didn't didn't really um, kick in into high gear until later in that decade, and and then it, it also in the 2010s. And in the 2010s, this is actually a real data point. We found very few road related landsliding after 2010, and I think none after 2015 in our inventory basins. So we don't have a quantitative way to compare road, road um, upgrades and decommission, decommissioning efforts against landslide rates, but we find the, the temporal correlation to be quite stunning. I wanted to address uncertainty. So we uh, went through a process of removing some of the smallest and the deep-seated landslides from our inventory due to detection challenges, um, but we don't think that that really uh, uh, affected the results because mitigation addresses all types of landslides, um, so there's no reason to think that excluded landslides are responding differently than the landslides we did include in the inventory. I also wanted to um, talk about this, this idea that maybe the time series of landsliding that we measured just arose due to some random process that we don't know what it is. We ran a, a um, we went through the, the process of trying to address that by doing these simulations of a random process many thousands of times um, to try to, with, with the same, that has the same, a random process with the same mean rate to try to see if we could generate a similar timeline of landsliding. And we essentially found that the timeline that we measured is highly unlikely to have arisen from, from, from some unknown random process. And then I also wanted to ad address the idea of the soil evacuation legacy, which is the idea that maybe all of the landslide pr prone terrain failed during the first round timber harvest. And so by the time the 90s came around, there wasn't actually much soil out there that was that was prone to failure. And we think that this is hi also highly unlikely um, uh, for, for a few reasons, but um, anecdotally, we uh, we go out and, and review timber harvest permits for uh, unstable slopes every week, every month, and we see many, many locations on the landscape that we think are prone to failure and still have plenty of soil and merchantable stands of timber in them, and those are now left in, in unstable slopes buffers. So we don't think that that's a, a very likely explanation to, that could explain our time trend. So in summary, are there temporal patterns of landslide abundance? Yes, and it was really interesting to note the different patterns between um, between the di different land management histories. Are the patterns related to climate? In no management, yes, and in managed forests, the signal was mixed. Are the patterns related to logging rate? In legacy management, yes, and in ongoing management, no. Are the patterns related to forestry practices? Yes. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kurt for some implications. All right, thanks, Gus. So what does it all mean? That's what it all comes down to. 
Um, do we have a watershed success story on our hands? Let's think about that for a second. Um, one, one metric for looking at landslide rates is the idea of uh, the range of natural variability. And uh, in this case, we have some data to do that. Um, this is the same plot you saw before with the three colors over our 80 year uh, inventory uh, history. And um, one way to gauge the range of natural variability is to look at the no management lands, which are indicated by the green bars. And that little gray shaded area is something that uh, sort of overlaps that range. Um, you can see that the bars kind of fluctuate within that on the unmanaged parts of the watershed. And I, I wanna point out that the no management landscape uh, is actually the steepest and most unstable based on the topography. So, um, so it's kind of maybe on the high end of what that range would look like. But regardless, um, we can see, first of all, that during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, clearly the uh, several of the, man, uh, the managed uh, strata were well outside of that range. So it confirms that, um, that there was a serious problem uh, in that era. But it also shows that in the last 30 years that those uh, bars have really come back into that range. So that's a very encouraging thing based on that, that approach. Let's kind of step back and think again about these different management uh, regimes because there's quite the uh, contrast between the federal lands and the, uh, and the uh, industry and state lands. So let's just think about what those, what those mean. Um, on federal uh, forests, mostly U.S. Forest Service land in the blue, that's always has the blue uh, data on the map and in the bars. Um, you know, essentially they really departed from a timber emphasis in the 1990s uh, in a big way. And as a result, by the mid 2000s, all the clear cuts had regrown and, and um, uh, recovery had happened. And that's a big part of the story there. Um, the other thing that came along with that was uh, without that active uh, logging program is uh, the for National Forest had a, a huge uh, road network that they no longer needed or, or could uh, stay on top of. And essentially they were able to downsize their road system. Uh, many of the main roads were repaired and that's why we can get out and get to some of those trailheads. But a lot of the side roads uh, were either decommissioned, which is uh, the term that they use for uh, taking a road apart and, and essentially putting in a, in a place where it can revegetate without any future maintenance or access. And they did that based on a risk-based system. And then the other thing that happened on a lot of forest roads is they just revegetated naturally. And that's what the picture uh, on this slide is showing you is what one of those roads looks like that is revegetated without any uh, treatment. And, you know, the take-home message here is between um, the recovery of the forests and the work that the forests did on their uh, road network is uh, a lot of those landslides have have dropped off and are not showing up anymore. So that seems to be have been a very effective uh, uh, way of uh, minimizing um, landslides, even though it was kind of a secondary goal, which the main reason was the spotted owl and some of the wildlife um, and endangered species issues, but it had that impact. Now, maybe even more interesting is what we see on the private and state forests, the orange bars, because they've been able to maintain uh, a vigorous uh, timber harvest uh, activity over the years um, throughout the entire uh, photo period. And so essentially, instead of stopping logging, they've uh, really emphasized leaving buffers on unstable slopes and streams and some other things we haven't talked about as much but um, those appear to have been uh, nearly as effective, if not uh, as much so. And their road network has been um, treated quite differently as well because those roads are still needed for management. Um, most of the roads on state and private have been upgraded with new culverts and, um, and silt traps and various uh, techniques to uh, reduce the impacts of those roads. And those appear to have been quite uh, effective as well. Um, and some of the, um, they have done some road uh, abandonment as well, which is similar to decommissioning, but essentially they've maintained most of their road network, um, but yet don't, aren't, aren't seeing anywhere near the kinds of uh, instability issues as plagued the older roads. So this is where things get interesting, the fish habitat response. 
Um, I always have to have one slide with a fish in it somewhere. Um, and I'm going to go back to that concept of a process, uh, uh, physical process approach to um, to recovery, and that always, by its nature, involves predictions. So let's review what we saw from those. Um, we did find that the treatments were being implemented, the road work and the buffers are out there. Um, they're not everywhere all the time, but there's a lot of them out there and they uh, seem to be um, doing their job. Uh, we do see much reduced landsliding as we have talked about extensively. Um, when we talk about uh, how do the fish know this has happened, things get more complicated because landslide uh, responses in channels is more complex and it involves lags. Sometimes that coarse sediment takes decades uh, or longer to uh, move down um, main stem river. So we can't really speak to that. And the main reason for that is because we didn't address that directly in our study. As we wrap things up, um, just a reminder that forests will continue to change. Um, this is a photo of the uh, fire up in New Halem from 2015. And uh, the point here is that, um, you know, we're seeing warmer, uh, hotter summers in general. Uh, potential for big fires is really on the increase. Uh, no doubt some buffers are gonna be burned. We'll see what happens then. Um, part of that story is climate change, of course. Uh, we're seeing predictions of stronger rainstorms. Um, on the other hand, we would also expect to see increased tree growth in our higher elevation forests. Maybe that would have a beneficial effect. Anyway, these are just a couple of the many types of uh, potential climate change implications that could interact with uh, landsliding and other sediment issues. Um, we are seeing a trend towards shorter timber rotations. This has been ongoing uh, since, uh, really since the mid 1900s. It's not a new thing, but uh, could this have some effect? Uh, we, we we don't necessarily think so as long as those buffers are being used properly, but it's something to consider. And then another uh, question is how the Forest Service is going to manage their forests. Um, they've mostly done relatively limited uh, thinning, um, but there is talk about them uh, maybe going back to a limited clear-cut harvest and, and a more um, active timber program. And so that could uh, change the story on those uh, on those lands. And that pretty much wraps up what we have to offer today. Um, we do want to uh, acknowledge uh, various folks that have collected a lot of the landslide data that we took advantage of, um, and also appreciate the excellent reviewers that helped us uh, tell the story better. Thank you. Hey, good report. Thank you for that uh, that review. I'm just curious, um, is there any sort of correlation or has there been any sort of assessment of how um, sediment processes in the lower delta uh, and the lower portions of the river have, um, have been influenced, impacted, changed relative to um, some of this sediment um, transport up, up in the upper reaches? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, that is an important question. Um, there has been work on this, but uh, we were only uh, minimally involved in that. So I think I'm going to have to punt that one for now. That's that's okay. And maybe it's more of a longer term question. It's just, um, I know some of the work that we've seen in previous science series um, shows kind of a bell curve on, on sediment in the delta as well. And I'm, I'm thinking that it it seems to maybe it's just coincidence correspond or at least not correspond, but uh, there might be some some linear things going on. But um, appreciate it, and I look forward to uh, that discussion. Thank you. Yeah, there was. You might be thinking of the paper that Greg Hood, my colleague Greg Hood, wrote. He had a he showed some data that that basically told the story you just summarized. Um, so yeah, there like like I said, there there definitely has been work looking at, at that. Um, but yeah, we're not in a position to really comment on that right now. But thanks. I'm wondering if I could just follow up on that real quickly. Yeah. I uh, mm -hmm. kind of related to that the downstream thing we're seeing. There was there's been some anecdotal comments from the water 
utilities that they are seeing um, decreased turbidity and cloudiness mm -hmm. in recent decades downstream. Um, curious, Kurt, if you guys have heard about that. Um, and maybe that's there's some follow up there from Brandon's question and this one as well. So we can touch out later. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm going to have to give you the same answer, uh, Richard, which is that, uh, yeah, we're aware of this. And also there's <clears throat> there's been some uh, some things coming out in some of the journals of a similar response in other parts of the region. Um, but, uh, you know, given that we don't really have data on that, we really uh, hesitate to um, to really offer much in that regard. Uh, wh while I have the podium here for a second, I'm I'm glad to see John Gold and and Kevin Killian here from the forestry side of things. And one thing I I wanted to mention in my talk was that uh, uh, if they if they have any comments to offer as far as uh, some of the forestry changes and maybe how they've impacted their operations and 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 finances. Um, that might be useful too. I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but I just thought with the group, the group here might be curious to hear, you know, how this looks from the landowner side of things. That would be wonderful if you're willing, John and Kevin. Um, I'll turn the floor over to you for wherever for you want to go. <laughs> sure. Uh, this is John Gold. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And uh, Kurt knows me well enough that I, I wouldn't miss the opportunity for anything. Uh, I, I do want to say thank you to Richard and, and all of you for uh, uh, inviting me and others to this talk. I, I appreciate it. Just a little bit background about who I am. Uh, I'm a forest manager for Sierra Pacific Industries. Uh, Kurt uh, mentioned that we were uh, one of the participants in supplying data for an earlier uh, iteration of, of this study. So, so just disclosure there, uh, we uh, own and manage about 150,000 acres in Wyra 1, 3, and 4. So, you know, a lot of the basins that Gus talked to here, um, we acquired those lands in, in 2006 and we managed them intensively for, for forest products. So just, just a little background about um, who I am and who Sierra Pacific is. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the talk that uh, that Kurt and Gus um, gave. I think it's very informative and it's certainly grown since I've heard some of the information from it before. Just to, to throw some numbers out for, for consumption, and I, I do recognize a lot of folks in this crowd. We, we, we're, we work with you. Um, others are, are a bit new to me. But uh, to, to put some numbers to the, the RMAP program, you know, this was roughly a 15-year program program, as, as Gus mentioned, here, uh, Sierra Pacific, in, in, in this watershed, we uh, did treatments to about 1,300 miles of forest roads. Um, we opened up about 20 miles of potential habitat um, for fish, and we spent about $20 million uh, doing so. Um, and if you blow that up statewide, this is a program not just that our company did, but required of all uh, large landowners. There was about $400 million put in of, of private funds towards um, uh, aquatic uh, restoration uh, around the state. Uh, the numbers that I've seen, it's a little bit over 9,000 barriers were removed, opening up about 6,500 miles of historic fish habitat. So. This is an accomplishment that uh, I think all landowners are, uh, you know, quite proud of, and uh, uh, and and kind of an unsung story that uh, uh, I, I just want to give some some magnitude um, to that. Um, and, and to Kurt's point at, at the end there, um, just thinking about the the forest products sector, right? The the Pacific Northwest is is one of the most productive from a tree growing sense regions worldwide and you know how do we do that in, in a way that uh doesn't adversely affect aquatic resources and and salmon productivity and 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 other things that we all hold dear so the the US is a, a net importer of about 30% of um of our wood products that that we use here and Washington state we we came together, many of you, landowners, regulators, to 
devise that set of mitigations that that Kurt and Gus talked to about how can we do both of these things. And um, I think it's important to, to look at about 70% of the harvest in Washington comes off of private lands and private lands are only about a third of our landscape. So the, the fact that we can document um, through studies like this, that we made some good assumptions back in the nineties and the two thousands, determine some effective um, mitigations and ways we can uh, really gain um, both sides of the benefits, the wood products the society asked for and the environmental benefits the society asked for. Um, there's a real success story here. And, you know, for all of us to think about how, you know, how do we take this forward? Um, you know, the, the forest and fish model um, is, mm -hmm. is really quite unique. And um, it's, it's not just simply we put some regulations out there. We we looked at that at the federal level. There's a habitat conservation plan that's in place for roughly three more decades that that uh, you know had the buy off of of the regulatory community at the state level, the federal level, the tribes such as Gus and and Kurt um, represent in um, delivering outcomes that we want for the Endangered Species Act compliance and for clean water. So. Uh, just just to add some color to what Kurt Kurt and Gert and Gus said there, um, you know, a, a, a big investment, but one that um, appears to be um, delivering um, big results from from our perspective as a forest landowner. Thank you for those comments. Very appreciated. And um, I was not aware of some of those facts, and so thank you for sharing. And I mean, yeah, we we need to celebrate these success stories. Absolutely. I still see, I see some hand, Jock, and then Brandon, do you have another one? Okay, go ahead, Jock. Thanks, John. <clears throat> thanks, great, great presentations, um, Gus and Kurt, appreciate that. Uh, thanks for your comments, John. So um, some of, I work, I'm at Long of the Kings and we have staff working out in the field in some river basins around the area. And one of the observations of one of my staff who's been around rivers a long time is that <clears throat> the sediment, um, uh, input into rivers seems to have accelerated over the last 50 years from the previous, say, 50 or 100 years, even though there was intensive forestry occurring on the land. And um, they attribute this to um, the, uh, over time, the, the disintegration of the root matrix in the soils of the, the old growth forest. So this was brought home to me by going to the um, Elwha River uh, basin after they removed the dams and seeing the exposed root wads of trees that were cut there a hundred years ago that were several hundred years old and they had, you know, 30 foot diameter root wads. Um, if you think of those interlocking, they, they probably really uh, served a purpose to retain, retain soils, particularly adjacent to streams. Um, and, and that could explain why even though forest uh, intensive forestry had gone on in the Skagit Basin for a long period of time, you're seeing an increase in sediment input into streams uh, more recently. Um, I'm wondering if there's some forest practice that can be um, advanced to mimic uh, the, the old uh, large root, root wads uh, that were in place in old growth forests, even in, in rapid, um, uh, rapid cycle, modern forestry? That's my question, thanks. I guess so we, guess could, you want to we could tag tag team maybe. Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks Jacques. Um, there, there's a lot in there. Um, so we, part a big part of the, the effort that we wanted to, a, a big part of the reason for, for doing this project was a lot of the inventory work had been, um, essentially halted landslide inventory work had been halted after the 90s when the when the relationships between forestry and landsliding were really coming into into clarity and so we wanted to update that work after 20 years of after the forest and fish report and the northwest forest plan in the 90s and whatnot um and so we uh have documented this decrease in sediment supply at least from landslides that um that occurred starting in the 90s when compared to earlier decades. So um, I guess 
there could be re if I, I couldn't tell from your question, maybe you're suggesting that the observations of your of your staff member differed from from the data set that we showed. And there's actually an uptick in, in sediment that they're seeing in the streams. Um, and I do you want to clar clarify if that yeah, yeah, I, I think that's essentially it. And I thought I saw a, di uh, a figure that that um, Kurt put up that indicated that there was an increase in sediment to supply to streams. Perhaps it was in the years before. Yeah, in the the, the peak yeah. really was in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, followed by a, a large decrease in the '90s in okay. in our inventory basins. Um, and so, I guess some caveats on that. Uh, you know, uh, sediment uh, from landslides out of forest lands is only one part of the sediment budget in a stream. So depending on where your staff member was looking, um, uh, an obvious thing I'm thinking of, if they were looking in some of the main stem rivers with glaciers upstream, um, there there could be increased sediment due to, to, to glacier melt and exposure of those soft glacier glacial deposits. Um, that we wouldn't have captured that in our in our uh, database at all. So there, and then there could be erosion of forest roads. I think in general, or just just it's not failure of roads, but just kind of some raveling of the surface of the of the road and getting into creeks. And in general, that's thought to be a pretty small component of the sediment budget when compared with with landslides in forest lands, but um, that could be contributing a, a different source of sediment that we wouldn't have been able to measure in our in our database. So there could be some things like that. Yeah, I'm thinking of the South Fork of the Skokomish River specifically. Yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with with that area. Right. Sorry. I mean, that's a good point that Gus brings up. You know, at, at times in the summer, uh, uh, those of us that lived around for a long time, you can see that glacial <laughs> till come out and I mean, a couple of years turned the lower Skagit here almost white. Um, so that whole sediment budget component, I think there's probably a talk within just within that. Of, of and that can impact some of the smaller streams too, like, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the lower reach, reaches of the Nooka Champs actually can backwater in the summer because of high flows off the Skagit. And some of that sediment can come up into those lower reaches and turn the water all turbid. So there can be some interesting local effects that are completely not related to landslides. Thanks, Gus. Brandon. Thank you. Uh, just one more question, I promise. <clears throat> um, and uh, thanks, John uh, Gold, for uh, for the comments. You know, Sierra Pacific has invested quite a bit in this area, and I think they uh, um, appropriately deserve some recognition. And I guess this question could be for him or for Kurt or, or Gus. I'm curious about tree growth and and um, and the age of the trees and how that correlates with maybe some of this. In that um, you know there was some pretty big clear cuts and things that happened, and it's my I guess assumption that actively growing trees, the earlier stages are going to take a lot more moisture than older ones. I might be totally wrong, so I'm looking for some clarification. I'm wondering if soil moisture content, um, as related to the age of the trees has any sort of corollary impact to um, the the slides or the susceptibility of, of slides, the moisture in, the, in, in that land used by the by, by those vegetation. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, so there's there, that, there can be a very complicated answer to that question, <laughs> but um, for landslides, we think that mostly we're, we're concerned with wintertime precipitation. And so uh, where, where when winter went, you know, went, fall and winter when all the major storms come through. And so in terms of water, uh, tr trees are, they're not transpiring a lot in the winter time. So it's really the canopy interception of water and then the evaporation off of that. Uh, that is that is that is kind of the limiting factor with canopy with with timber harvest. And so we think that the greatest there, there's literature on on kind of what the timeline of the progression back to canopy closure and evaporation and things like that um, is. And I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it's something on the order of of uh, a couple decades, something like that, before you're really getting back to a, 
condition where the canopy is able to capture that water and and transpire it or not not transpire it evaporate it back into the atmosphere and it's some component it's a portion of the of the overall precipitation that's reaching reaching the forest floor right even in a in a mature forest some precipitation obviously is reaching the the forest floor um, but you maybe there's a reduction of somewhere to, in the on the order of 30 to 50 percent or something like that I can't remember exactly um, due to the canopy thank you for that I appreciate it thanks John yep you're welcome thank you any other just a comment from somebody who tracks floods, it's very interesting to me that the 1990s period would not be a period of increased sediment flow because the double pump in 1990 was a tremendous storm event, and it was followed in 1996 by something that was, in terms of the volume downstream, very comparable. So that for the the soils and the sediments to be in as much uh, stasis as they were, as much reduction from the earlier period, seems to me even more impressive because of the presence of what I would consider a very serious storm test of the sufficiency of the buffers and the changes in the road system mm -hmm. as compared to the earlier period. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, I don't believe in the 80s there were anything that would be comparable in the way of a storm event to the 1990 or 1996 uh, floods. Yeah, it's a great point, Gary. And uh, also the 03 floods were, mm -hmm. were, were, were quite large. So again, another test in that decade. And the 80s, there were some floods in the 80s. I remember seeing that um, in, the, in the data that we used, they, they, they weren't as big as the 90s. And then I think in the 70s, there were... Um, hardly there was hardly anything that showed up in the in the flow gauge data and so um and remember the 70s was that that peak of management related landsliding so quite a remarkable um a relationship there between floods and landsliding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah let me just add that uh in a big basin like the Skagit it's uh there's a lot of variability within different parts of the basin different different storms uh, create different flood responses and uh, uh, you know the the great majority of the Skagit watershed area is in the is in the alpine and upper areas that are minimally managed. So most of the impacts that we see are in these down downstream tribs in Day Creek and Finney Creek and some of these areas. So sometimes they just respond to completely different storm events, and that's one reason why it was nice to have the Samish River uh, data set because that really reflects. The types of conditions that drive these uh, these lower elevation trips where most of the forestry is, but it's very intriguing trying to uh, find the connection between those things. I've I've spent years doing it, and it it's it's very straightforward until you start looking at actual data. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a good, great comment. Um, anybody else? Okay. Well, again, thank you, Kurt and Gus. That was excellent. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody uh, and to all the good questions. Um, and to a, to a success story, management can work. Um, yeah, don't hesitate to contact us if there's any sure. other thoughts that come to your mind. Yep. And thank, thank you, John, for, for your comments. You're welcome. <laughs>